Who has two thumbs and is always late to the party? This guy. Finally got my hands on a Raspberry Pi 4, and I thought this would be a great opportunity to talk about some of the other models of the Raspberry Pi, and uh, talk about why, if you're not a Raspberry Pi enthusiast, but it's something that you've heard of, that something that maybe you've thought that is only limited to, say, um, tech enthusiasts, I want to tell you, it is not that hard to get into the world of Raspberry Pi. I know that uh, these little credit card size looking uh, single board computers look like they could be intimidating, but they are actually not. And most of the projects that are involved with Raspberry Pi are so uh, simplified and so well documented that most people can really just download the images, flash them to an SD card, plug them into a Raspberry Pi, and be up and running and good to go. And the great thing about it is there are a ton of projects that you can do with these Raspberry Pis and you don't have to be a tech whiz to pull these off. So I want to talk about the different generations of Raspberry Pi and the different versions that are available. And I only have a few of them. I don't have everything that's on the market or has been on the market. But uh, this right here, this is the first gen and this is the uh, standard form factor. The big differences between the first gen and the following gens is that these used full-size SD cards. The next gens used micro SD cards. These also had, they had your standard HDMI output port, but they also had an analog port here. Now, what a lot of people don't know is that this is your analog port for video. This is your analog port for audio. The current versions, the current gen has a, uh, you can plug a breakout cable into this, that this is analog audio and video from this port here, in addition to your HDMI. This is a Model 3B. I've got a 2 written on here. Ignore that. It's because it was the second unit in a cluster. But um, another big difference between the original and the following models is that the original model had a 26-pin GPIO and the current models have a 40-pin GPIO. And this being the Model 3, uh, when they released the Model 3, they added Bluetooth and Wi-Fi built into the chip. These original models did not have Bluetooth or Wi-Fi, and the version 2 also did not have Bluetooth or Wi-Fi. The next big difference is the USB ports. Model 3, USB 2.0, Model 1, USB 2.0. Model 2 as well had USB 2.0. The Model 1 only had two ports. With the Model 2, they added four ports. This being Model 3 also has four ports. That's the big difference physically between these two models that you can actually see. You can see the board layout is considerably different. The cases were different carrying through from the first gen to the second gen. And uh, now with the fourth gen, they're even more different. So we'll go over that when I open the box up of the fourth gen and take a look at that. I want to throw a spec sheet up for each model on the screen so you can take a look at this yourself. What I don't have to show here that I will also throw up on the screen uh, is a Raspberry Pi Model Zero and the Model Zero W. The Model Zero was a model without Wi-Fi and the Model Zero W was a Zero that did have Wi-Fi. So with all of that being said, I want to get into the unboxing of this Raspberry Pi Model 4. Uh, this is considerably more powerful than even the third gen and has a lot more features. Um, basically, uh, this is the kit that I got off of Amazon. I'm going to put a link to this in the description below so you can check it out for yourself. This kit cost me around $100, and in the kit we've got the Raspberry Pi itself. We've got a power supply, uh, a micro SD card, a fan, micro HDMI to full size HDMI, some promotional and instructional paperwork, a case, a USB-C adapter, 
and this is a oh this is a USB uh, power switch cable as I see this one thing of note that I wanted to point out is that the original generations of Raspberry Pis most of them did not come with a uh, power switch on the plug and the Raspberry Pi doesn't have a, a power switch built onto the board so the third-party click switches became pretty handy and it's nice to see that this kit comes with an on and off switch in that I really appreciate that a lot. I'm going to open up the box here and compare this to the Model 3. Right away the big difference is that the uh, HDMI slot is no longer a full-size HDMI slot. Now what we have are two micro HDMI outputs here. It looks like everything else is pretty close to the design layout. We've got power slot, used to be micro USB, and the new one is USB-C. The other big difference is, okay, well it looks like things have switched around here so we instead of having our USB ports on this side now they've moved over here and our Ethernet port which used to be over here is now moved over here and it's it looks like they just flipped things upside down this uses a micro SD for its operating system and we'll get into how you can install your operating systems to that micro SD I would assume that this is still an analog audio and video port so that you can plug a, a RCA breakout cable into this and get video and audio that way if you need to. There are dozens and dozens of different case styles for these Raspberry Pis and some of them are very, okay here we go, some of them are very hardcore and some of them are just kind of very flimsy. I've dealt with both types. This one seems to be pretty average down the line. Basically you will just set your board in the case like this. Let's see, there we go. But you get it to set flat and then you'll just put the top on here and clamp it down. I'm not gonna do that yet because I want to do some more stuff like put the fan in here. To hook up our fan we need to run our 5 volt into 5 volt goes into that pin right there and our ground goes into the pin right beside it. And then our fan clips up in here in this case. I've seen some cases where they screw in. It's nice that this one just kind of clips in like that. Makes it easy to deal with. If your kit came with heat sinks, make sure you adhere them to the relevant spots on the board. All right, so we got our fan on and we're gonna just kind of ever so slightly snap it together and that was easy. Now we've got our slot for our micro SD card which goes in here. So this one's shipped with a 32 gigabyte Samsung Evo micro SD card. It's a pretty nice micro SD card. I've run the first gens on cards as small as four gigabyte, maybe even two. It's been a while, I can't remember. But anyway, this is a for a lot of, of uh, operating systems that run off of the Raspberry Pi. This is overkill. But it's better to have it not need it than need it not have it. So I'm going to throw this in here. So we're going to boot this up, take a look and see what we got. But before I do that, we've got to get into the power supply. And <laughs> I can tell you already, this is a lot heavier than the power supplies that came with the Raspberry Pi 3s and less. This, this thing really feels like it's no joke. And that's because I imagine the Raspberry Pi 4 takes a lot more power than previous models. But yeah, here we go. We've got the USB-C, which I'm going to plug this into this 
clickable power switch that comes with this. And we're going to plug this into right here. And I love USB-C. It doesn't matter which way you plug it in. With the previous models, it was a 50-50 chance of getting it right, and I got it wrong 83% of the time. And it is really hard to see here, but I was looking for HDMI 1 or 2 to see which one of these was which. This is marked HDMI 0, and this is marked HDMI 1. So I'm going to plug the micro HDMI cable into HDMI 0. I'm going to plug in a receiver for a USB keyboard and mouse into one of these USB 2.0 ports. I'm going to go over to my computer and I'm going to plug this into a capture card, power this thing on, and see what we get. All right, so booting up the included micro SD card, we get a pretty standard fare here. Um, we have the option to install from that card the Raspberry Pi OS full. This is going to be like your desktop OS. Uh, it's based on Debian. And down here we have the option of installing LibreELEC. LibreELEC is based on Kodi, and it's a really awesome uh, media entertainment center uh, media management application. We're going to go with the Raspberry Pi OS full here. And I do want to change my English to US. I'm going to skip on the Wi-Fi network for now because I'm going to just plug in an Ethernet cable. So after we select what OS we want to use with this installation, we click on install. And this will take a few minutes to install. Okay, so the operating system has installed successfully. We can click on OK. Now it's going to reboot the system. Okay, so we get this uh, after the reboot, we get this Welcome to the Raspberry Pi desktop before you start using it. There's a few things we need to set up. We're going to go through this setup process here. And most of this is just fill in the blank stuff here. I'm in the United States, American English, time zone. Uh, I'm in the Detroit time zone, so that'll work. Use US keyboard, that's fine. Next. So the default Pi user account is currently has the password Raspberry. It is strongly recommended that you change this to a different password that only you know. So um, you can key in a password here. I'll go ahead and do that. Um, it says the desktop should fill the entire screen. Tick the box below if your screen has a black border around the edges. We see that I indeed do have this, this black border, so we're going to tick this checkbox here. Click on Next. I'm gonna, I don't want to add this to a wireless network. I've got it plugged into an Ethernet network here, so I'm going to skip that. And it says the operating system and applications will now be checked and updated if necessary. This may involve a large download. Click next to check the... Press next to check and update software. Skip to continue without checking. I'm going to skip this for now. And your Raspberry Pi is set up and ready to go. Press restart to start restart the Pi. I'm going to restart this. I don't know if you saw that flash for a second there, but it said hold shift for recovery mode. I think what happens if you hold shift when you do boot up like that is it will launch the noobs installer again. Okay, so here we go. This is our desktop, and I love this beautiful background here. I think that's Thailand. <laughs> anyway, with that rambling out of the way, if you are unfamiliar with the Debian OS, basically uh, you access everything from up here. And what you can actually do is um, uh, you can move this down if you want. And that's how I prefer it. I use Windows about 90% of the time, so I just prefer my taskbar being down on the bottom and the launch, uh, the launch menu being down on the bottom left. And just a personal preference. 
So in here we've got different things that we can use. We've got, um, you know, we've got where we can go in here and mess around with our different uh, preferences. Um, we've got uh, our file manager here, which is also down here on the taskbar. You can. This is how you get around the operating system. The directory structure is in this. The directory structure is launched from this folder here. Close that out. But you can see that it's got a it's got a layout that is somewhat intuitive as far as finding your things. You've got your documents and your downloads, music, music and pictures, videos, all that good stuff. You've got your Office applications here that are based in LibreOffice. You've got some games here. Um, I don't really know my... I, okay, sure, let's play some Minecraft. This is actually very responsive. It, it's playing really nice. I know I'm supposed to be using a shovel or whatever here, but um, <laughs> I haven't played Minecraft in five ever. Uh, I don't even remember how to get into the inventory to change that. But for a computer that's the size of a credit card, this is running really well and fairly impressive. Okay, I don't know how to go full screen on that. Close this out. We'll look at some more things down here. So we've got VLC Media Player. We've got the Chromium web browser, which is a, for all intents and purposes, think of this as Google Chrome. All right, so we got YouTube loaded up here, and um, uh, we're going to see how video plays. It's super cliche for me to go to my own channel, so what I'm going to do is I'm going to load up uh, my buddy Christian channels over at the Digital Life. Uh... Me for using Windows. And a lot of content creators these days are only making videos about how to switch. And video Windows playback looks pretty smooth. And they are telling you, you should never use Windows because it's just a crap. And so on auto 720p, system, you should always switch to change Windows. that to 1080, even, see what happens. Even considering that other people may also switch back from Linux to Windows or use... So video playback looks good, and if you want to see a guy who is a lot smarter than me in the IT world, go check out Christian at The Digital Life. I'll put a link to his channel in the description below. So the Raspberry Pi was built to be a development machine to teach people coding, and it's really kind of um, evolved a lot further from there to become all these other things that people have done these projects with. And it's really become a machine for the layman for projects where your average user can just basically like drop an image on the SD card and boot it up and be ready to go. And um, in my next video, I'm going to show you how to do that. This one, I think, is starting to run a little bit long. But um, I do want to show you one thing real quick here. This is the Linux terminal. And if you are following instructions on uh, installing something on Raspberry Pi. A lot of times you'll run into these instructions where people will tell you to open up the terminal and type in commands. That is right here, and this is what that looks like. So, um, you know, a lot of, uh, a lot of um, Linux commands can be um, uh, executed right in this this terminal and a lot of the Debian based commands should work here as well and I'm gonna run a very important command that if you're getting into the world of Raspberry Pi this can be a very handy command for you to use but uh, this is just it's 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 raspi config this is a command that needs to be run with higher privileges and in and the way you do that in Linux is you run that with the 
It's the sudo command. And because old habits die hard, I've always called it the sudo command because I read it as sudo. What this stands for is super user do. So it's sudo raspy, and I know it's raspi, config. So now we got this interface where we can go in and, and uh, make all kinds of like deep configuration changes to how our Raspberry Pi operates. So yeah, I just wanted to show you how to get to the Raspy config screen. For the most part, I would recommend not messing with anything in this. If you're not familiar, if you're following a tutorial that um, instructs you to do this, then by all means, that's how you get in here and and uh, make the changes to the configuration settings for the Pi. But for the most part, like I said, if you don't know what you're doing, just leave this alone. So that's my mini tour of the Raspberry Pi for the absolute beginner. If you're interested in content like this, stick around because in the coming weeks, I'm going to be doing a lot more stuff with the Raspberry Pi 4. Next week, I plan on showing a port of the Linux FX system to Raspberry Pi. So, uh, it's going to basically be running a uh, Windows 10 clone here on Raspberry Pi. So that should be pretty cool. And I've got a lot more projects coming down the pipe that are also going to be involved with uh, Raspberry Pi. So that's it for getting started with Raspberry Pi. I hope you found something in this video useful. And if you did, be sure to check out one of my other videos on this channel. I'm going to be having a lot of Raspberry Pi content coming up in the future, so if you don't want to miss more of that, make sure you subscribe. Now I'd like to take the opportunity to thank all of my Patreon supporters, and if you would like to help, there's going to be a link in the description below. Donations are appreciated, but never required, especially in these hard times. Look out for you and yours first. If you'd like to help this channel grow, do all of the YouTube stuff down below like, comment, share, subscribe. I do my best to answer all of the questions that come through my comments section, and I try to answer them as quickly as possible. Thank you so much for watching. Your time is valuable, and I appreciate that you spent that time watching this video. That's it for now, and I'll see you next time.